As Israel intensifies its shelling of Gaza, what does Washington want from Arab countries? The U.S. Secretary of State is in the region to show support for Israel, but can Biden's administration prevent the war from spilling over in the Middle East? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm James Bays. As war rages in Gaza, the US is engaging in a flurry of diplomacy across the Middle East. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has made a show of support for Israel, closely followed there by Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin. But many of Washington's Arab allies are conflicted. Many have moved closer to Israel in recent years, but on the streets, many people are rallying in a show of solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. We'll go to our panel in just a few moments, but first, Fintan Monahan has this report. The U.S. Secretary of State had two messages for his Israeli ally. The first was complete support for its campaign and its right to self-defense. The other was a call to protect civilians caught in the crossfire. It's so important to take every possible precaution to avoid harming civilians. And that's why we mourn the loss of every innocent life. Civilians of every faith, every nationality who've been killed. But diplomacy becomes more challenging for Blinken as he seeks support in the Arab world. He wants to prevent the conflict from spreading and minimize support for Hamas and other armed groups in Gaza. But there have been protests in many parts of the Middle East, expressing outrage at Israel's campaign and solidarity with Gaza. This outcry is putting pressure on leaders. Many are U.S. allies and some have normalized relations with Israel in recent years. Israel's bombing campaign in Gaza has killed hundreds of civilians, and its siege cutting off food and water supplies has been widely condemned. Qatar could play a key role as a potential mediator. It doesn't have ties with Israel, but it maintains links with both Hamas and the West. Blinken set out two areas where they're working together. We discussed in detail our efforts to prevent any actor, state or non-state, from creating a new front. Uh, in this conflict. We're also working intensively together to secure the release of hostages, including American citizens, being held by Hamas in Gaza. But Qatar's prime minister made it clear there were differences too. His nation wants an immediate ceasefire. We cannot uh, deprive uh, the people in Gaza from electricity, water, and uh, medicine, and like, all the means uh, of life. The U.S. has many allies in the region, but Israel's campaigns place them in a difficult position. How much cooperation can they give their partners in Washington at the risk of ignoring public opinion in their own backyard? Vinton Monahan for Inside Story. Well, let's now bring in our panel of guests to discuss all of this. In East Jerusalem, Yara Hawari, a senior analyst at the Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, an independent think tank. In Washington, D.C., Rich Outzen, he's a retired U.S. Army colonel who works as a geopolitical consultant. And in Munich, we have Nancy O'Kale. She's president and CEO of the think tank Center for International Policy. Welcome to you all. We have Anthony Blinken on a diplomacy tour. Now, that's word diplomacy often means that he's trying to um, try and get some sort of peace. But as we know, he's not actually seeking a ceasefire. In fact, in all likelihood, uh, Yara, he's preparing the Arab world, isn't he, for a greater conflict with Israeli troops entering uh, a ground offensive stage. Absolutely. And I think there are really three main things that, that Blinken has been focusing on. Firstly, that's the stability, or what he calls the stability of the region. And this is particularly important in light of the, the many protests of solidarity, which has seen tens of thousands hit the streets uh, from Baghdad to Tunis. And, and indeed, the Arab governments will be worried about, you know, threats to their own stability um, amidst their inaction, because the Palestinian struggle, despite normalization between many governments, um, is still held dear to the hearts of so many across the, the Middle East. So Blinken will want reassurance uh, from these heads of state that they will be maintaining the stability and internal repression. But also the issue of Israeli cap uh, cap you know, he was in, in Qatar, as you mentioned, and, and I think, you know, this is one of the few countries that has a direct line with Hamas. Um, but 
what's interesting is that Blinken seems more concerned about the Israeli captives than the Israeli regime itself. And we've seen various Israeli ministers, um, army personnel, um, completely dismiss the recovery of captives in favor of bombing Gaza into oblivion. And we have reports from Gaza that indeed um, some Israeli captives have died in, in the bombardment. But I also think, and this is you know, one of the, the, the most important points that Blinken will be trying uh, to, to, to emphasize is the creation of this so-called humanitarian corridor. And I think, you know, we have to pause for a second and think about what that means. You know, on the basis that they're describing it as the safe passage for Palestinians to get out of Gaza. But the fear is that actually this is not a humanitarian corridor at all, but rather a permanent march of exile. We know that the Israeli regime does not respect any of the international conventions on the right of return for refugees. So there is no expectation whatsoever that once the bombardment has stopped, that Palestinians will be allowed back to their homes. So what Blinken is essentially doing, and probably consciously so, is that he's facilitating the ethnic cleansing of Gaza. Rich, let me bring you in. We've seen in the first stage of this trip very, very staunch support from for Israel from the Secretary of State, despite some of the things we're seeing on the ground that Yara's just talked about, despite comments coming from Israeli ministers imposing a complete siege, the defence minister calling Gazans human animals, he has very much taken the Israeli side. Is that, because you're there consuming US media, is that part, partly because of the media coverage and the public opinion in the United States, would you say? Well, I, I think it's uh, due in part to those things. Certainly, the media coverage and the framing, the narratives, if you will, in Washington and most of Europe, uh, certainly Western Europe, differs quite a bit from what one sees in most of the Middle East. But I mean, look, empirically, not just in terms of framing, this is a very different sort of attack. So most Americans uh, have taken the scenes that, that came out, especially in the uh, early hours of the attack on Saturday and Sunday of uh, specific individual targeting of Israelis as an uh, intolerable atrocity. And similar to what happened in the United States after 9-11, uh, when you know there was a visceral response to that that galvanized support for the strongest sorts of actions, I think there's sort of an echo of that in terms of very strong support publicly, uh, with the exception of some folks on university campuses, uh, to for Israel to take similarly strong steps. Now, as you'll recall, the, we were led into strategic error, perhaps, uh, with the invasion of Iraq and other steps because of the anger over outrageous terrorist acts. So one has to take uh, the moral outrage and balance that with what's going to actually work to stabilize and reduce tensions. And that's what Blinken's trip is all about. On the one hand, he had to validate the anger not just of Israelis, but the American people about the nature of these attacks on civilians. And yes, we can talk about whether that's a double standard with regards to the suffering of Gaza civilians, but there is a palpable anger in the United States, so he has to respect that and show solidarity with Israel, while at the same time trying to keep this from blowing over into something that kills the Abraham Accords, kills regional normalization efforts between Israel and Arab states, and potentially brings in other combatants. Nancy, let me bring you in. Stage two of the trip, he went from um, Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv, to Jordan, and he met the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Jordan. And interestingly, worth noting, I think, he didn't go there on his normal jet. He had to take a US C-17 plane. Uh, in terms of meeting Mahmoud Abbas in Jordan, that was a snub, wasn't it? Yes, uh, sort of, and I, I think it's just like one of the different ways that the uh, U.S. government is trying to appease Israel uh, and making sure to send a message that they are not both on the same level, uh, and this has been reflected very clearly and um, and strongly about the support for Israel. Of course, Israel has the right to defend itself, but it doesn't have the right to uh, attack civilians and uh, have the ultimatum that was given, basically uh, trying to get a license to kill, giving 1.1 million Palestinians in Gaza 24 hours to, uh, to move. Uh, so uh, I think we just, this is 
all consistent with what we have been say seeing with the U.S. administration. It is trying to send a message that you no, know, both countries are not on the same level, even though, to President Biden's credit, he did uh, stress the point of uh, observing international humanitarian law and uh, supporting and preserving uh, civilian lives. Yara, as you uh, as uh, Nancy said, there it was while he was in Jordan that Israel then issued this evacuation order that some international lawyers say is basically a case of forced transfer. There's been such strong reaction. Uh, to that. Uh, the UN Secretary General strongly uh, per urging Israel uh, to rescind the order. The International Committee of the Red Cross saying the instructions are not compatible with international humanitarian law. And the World Health Organization saying moving severely ill people amounts to a death sentence. What's your reaction, Yara, to the fact that then Antony Blinken really didn't criticize that at all? I mean, it's shocking, but also not surprising at the same time. The U.S. has been a staunch ally um, of the Israeli regime for, for many years. It's seen as sort of this, this regime that protects its interests in the, the Middle East and has really given carte blanche um, to commit a whole host of war crimes against the, the Palestinian people. I think what's particularly shocking about this moment um, is that all these organizations have, have actually come out and alluded to uh, ethnic cleansing. They've even used uh, words such as uh, genocide. And yet we still have Blinken and also others, including, you know, politicians um, from the European Union, encouraging this, not even um, playing it down, which is what they usually do. Um, they are actually encouraging this by sending, for example, the U.S. has sent munitions um, to the Israeli regime um, and has stated time and time again, you know, that, that the U.S. is an unwavering friend of the Israeli regime as it commits these massive war crimes. Moving 1.1 million people to the south of Gaza is not possible in the time frame that they've given. And they know this. And they know that many people in hospitals will not be able to move. They know that they have bombed roads and infrastructure. We even have reports and video evidence of Israeli regime bombardments targeting convoys of people leaving. So many Palestinians are actually choosing not to leave because at the end of the day, they know that there is a likelihood that they will be bombed and that they will die and that they would prefer to do so in their own homes. And I think we have to be very clear that the US and, and Blinken are facilitating this and encouraging it. They are warmongering. Rich, the West all seemed to be on the same page a week ago, yet we've seen the developments of the continued bombardment, this order for people to move, and now you're getting comments like this, uh, the Irish Prime Minister um, cutting off power, cutting off fuel supplies and water supplies. That's not the way a respectable democratic state should conduct itself. And uh, on the evacuation, the EU high representative for foreign policy, Joseph Borrell, evacuation is utterly, utterly impossible to implement. The Western partners are beginning to split. Do you think Washington will be worried? Well, it, it's actually consistent with historical patterns. If you look at previous bouts of violence, involving Israel and either uh, neighboring states that have attacked Israel or gotten involved in war with Israel or the sort of uh, outbursts of violence involving the, the Palestinian territories. Typically what happens is there's sort of a clock that starts uh, ticking, right? And both for Washington and key allies in Europe, there's normally a great deal of sympathy for Israel, which from my point of view in this case is absolutely warranted given the nature of the terror attacks. Uh, but then there's also a fear that Israel's response will be asymmetric and will inflict too much pain, not on the Hamas terrorists who carried this, these attacks out, but on the average uh, Palestinians who are trying to live their life in Gaza. I'm also sympathetic to that. So th this sort of spinning off or splitting off of a monolithic support for Israel is very typical, and it will accelerate. So there's sort of a clock going on this. And Israel has two tasks, really, in my view. The first is to change... Uh, the nature of Hamas's activities in the Gaza Strip so that this can never happen again. We can't ignore the nature of what was allowed to happen. And Gaza is uh, ruled over by Hamas, but we should not make the mistake of thinking Hamas represents the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian people. They're a terror group, in this case, at least part of them a terror group that executed these attacks. So while removing their ability to reprise this, Israel really has to be mindful that, yes, even people in Washington will increasingly become impatient with and uncomfortable with scenes of dead civilians in Gaza uh, and the movement of, the, as you say, the 1.1 million people. So that 
uh, that's the wheel turning, and Israel has to be mindful of that as it conducts its response. Uh, the next leg of the trip went from Jordan to Qatar. Again, I think, e efforts to try and uh, encourage regional players to stop any escalation and spillover of the war. But, of course, Qatar plays a, a unique role, as you all three know, because it's a channel of communication with Hamas. And that brings up the issue of the captives. I was actually attending uh, the, uh, the, the press conference that took place between the Qatari Prime Minister and the Secretary of State, and I spoke to an advisor to the Qatari Prime Minister about the captives and what Qatar was going to do. The focus from the American side was very clearly, as uh, Secretary Blinken stated in the press conference, uh, seeking more uh, from uh, Qatar when it comes to the uh, role of uh, facilitating contact and making sure that the channels of communication stay open so we can see uh, efforts uh, progressing towards uh, the release of, uh, of prisoners and the de-escalation and in talking to other regional players to make sure that there is no uh, extra ex escalation outside the scope of the current... Uh... And Qatar has a unique role when it comes to those prisoners because you have the contacts with Hamas and you've been involved in the past in brokering truces in Gaza. What do you think are the chances of being able to get some of those prisoners released? Of course, we are talking about a very complicated scene on the ground uh, at the moment. I, I can tell you that we are at an early stage where a lot of exploration is, uh, is taking uh, place. The shelling of uh, Gaza continues relentlessly in a, in a way that it would make it very difficult even logistically to speak about uh, such, uh, such issues, issues. However, we are also relentless in our uh, communications and in making sure that all parties understand what is at hand here. And uh, we, we are always optimistic. Nancy, from Qatar, the Secretary of State went very briefly to Bahrain. It wasn't on the original list, and he only stopped off at the airport. And then uh, to Saudi Arabia and UAE. Now, these countries are different from Qatar because they are either countries that have normalised relations with Israel or Saudi Arabia, according to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, was on the cusp of doing so. How difficult, Nancy, do you think it will be in these countries, given that public opinion may be in a very different place from the, the opinion of the leadership? I think this moment and the escalation that we have been seeing over the past week have shed light on how the assumptions and the foundations upon which the so-called Abraham Accords for Peace uh, have been uh, problematic and have been uh, fragile as well. Uh, the, the Abraham Accords and, and all like the efforts for normalization have ignored the people of the regions and focused on forging peace deals or defense deals as the controversial U.S.-Saudi Arabia uh, defense deal that has been in discussions over the past weeks. Uh, and uh, this has been such a short-sighted view that thinking that you could have uh, uh, first of all, I mean, a defense or, uh, or, or normalization deal with leaders who are not going to be authoritarian and not representing the public uh, and expect that this would be sustained and could be stable. Now, the events of the past seven days have shown that this is not possible because the situation is unfair uh, then the deals themselves have been forged uh, on terms that were not giving justice to Palestinians, basically giving crumbs to the Palestinians while focusing on arms deals between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. All this combined is contributing to the, the very well understanding that everyone is now hopefully aware of that you cannot push such deals or agreements for normalization with, I would say, not just authoritarian views, but I say, I'd say the individuals, and uh, this is the crown prince of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, you are forging a deal with an individual, not a country, and not uh, with uh, an uh, agreement or um, so, uh, the, the approval of the people. 
uh, the reason why most Arab leaders right now are into negotiations and showing support for um, Saudi Arabia, uh, showing support for Palestine is of course for Palestine, but also for their own stability, because they are very well aware that as the situation continues, as we see the videos emerging of Gazans being bombed, even when they're trying to follow the rules and evacuate, this would not sit in well with the public. There will be protests, and uh, they are not ready to uh, face this. Uh, and that's why they are trying hard right now to play an effective role. Yara, if I could ask you about what is the final leg of the trip, which is to Egypt. In many ways, Egypt is the most important because it, many describe Gaza as an, the largest open-air prison in the world. And if Israel is the jailer, then Egypt also has a key uh, to that pr prison. There have been suggestions, I, I wonder if you've heard these, from some in Israeli political circles, that the ultimate aim is to remove all the citizens of Gaza and send them uh, to the Sinai and, and, and get them out of Gaza. Is that something that Palestinians are really concerned about at this stage? Yes, I think so. And that's why I kept using the term ethnic cleansing, because I don't think it will stop with the bombardment. I think the ultimate goal was to push Palestinians out of Gaza uh, or even to cut Gaza in half. So it's an even smaller, smaller space. And we've heard um, Israeli officials talking uh, about wanting um, to pressure Egypt into opening um, the, the crossing to allow Palestinians to uh, to go into the Sinai Peninsula, and they've even described setting up a tent city. This um, amounts to, obviously, a war crime. It's the forced displacement uh, of an, ent an entire population of people that are already refugees um, several, several generations in. And that's why we're seeing messages um, and uh, social media posts from people in Gaza saying that they will not leave their homes because they know that leaving their homes will probably mean that they will be exiled permanently from them. So I think it's very clear that we are seeing the Israeli regime attempting uh, to garner support uh, for this plan. They will call it, of course, a temporary um, uh, rehousing or a temporary moving of people for their safety. But the reality, uh, um, and you know, you don't have to take my word for it, we have seven decades um, of Israeli regime consistently denying Palestinian refugees the right to return home as proof of, of, of their intentions. But I do think it will be a hard sell to the Egyptian regime. The Egyptian regime certainly does not want um, uh, uh, any Palestinian refugees uh, refugees, let alone um, uh, millions of them, uh, in within their borders, um, and so I think that they, if they will go through with this, the U.S. will have to come up with a big prize for the Egyptian regime uh, for them to to open their borders. Let me bring in Nancy on that. How destabilizing it could could it be for Egypt if there were not necessarily all of the people in Gaza, but a lot of people in Gaza came into Egypt because <laughs> President Sisi is not all that strong, is he? Well, this would be highly destabilizing, and uh, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is well aware of that. But before we talk about how this destabilizing this would be for Egypt, we also need to, I mean, and I just want to underscore what Yara said, that uh, the displacement and exporting the problem to Egypt uh, has been in the plans and the works, and they try to do that. I mean, the Israelis and, and back before the Biden administration, uh, uh, Kushner and Trump has tried to do that uh, and trying to um, move the Palestinians to Sinai, thinking if they throw money over the issue and bribe the Egyptian government, uh, that would work. And of course, again, this is the, the same false assumptions upon which the Abraham Accords have been founded. Now, I think uh, President Sisi, surprisingly, have been uh, really uh, are clear about national security in, in Egypt. So he had measured and wise responses. I mean, I think just a, a, a few hours ago, there were news that uh, 
yes, I mean, Egypt would support the uh, American nationals who are in Gaza to cross Rafah. However, he made a clear condition that this would only be possible if you allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. I mean, like, okay. this is... I, I want to bring Rich uh, in on that. I, I want to bring Rich, Rich in on that, Nancy. There is this deal, it seems, for... Uh, U.S. nationals and other U, um, dual nationals, we think there are about 500 to 600 U.S. citizens uh, in Gaza, for them to leave, uh, leaving behind, of course, the other 2.4 million Gazans uh, who were there under siege with no power and no water. At the end of this trip, if that is achieved by Secretary of State Blinken, will he see that as a success? Well, yes, it's the first responsibility of any state to protect its citizens, and that goes for the United States as well as it goes for Israel and for Egypt, who we've just been discussing. Uh, in uh, comparison with the 2006 war, for instance, in which uh, there was an extensive bombing of Lebanon uh, by the Israeli Air Force after Hezbollah abducted uh, Israelis and attacked northern Israel, there was an extensive tens of thousands of U.S. citizens were evacuated from Lebanon. So it would not be uh, unusual, nor would it be uh, as onerous a task in logistics terms to move five or 600 people. Now, the other thing I want to uh, bring up is, is that I, I have a very different interpretation of what Israel's been trying to do prior to this attack. I don't believe the story that they've been trying to move the, the Gaza Palestinians out into Sinai. As a matter of fact, the Israelis have tried the exact opposite. Their approach, and one of the reasons they were caught off guards by Hamas's attack is because they have been banking on the quiescence of the Palestinians in Gaza based on increased living standards. And to that end, they've issued uh, over the last two to three years a greatly in increased number of work permits. So we had Gaza Palestinians who had for long not been able to cross uh, into Israel proper coming to work in agricultural and industrial enterprises. So the Israelis actually thought that this was going to result in a decrease of uh, tensions because the Palestinians could stay and live in Gaza decently and come to work in Israel. This was Rich, an economic peace. Rich, we're going to thank you failed. very much. We've come to the end of our time. Thank you very much to all of our panel of guests, Yara Hawari, Rich Outsen, and Nancy O'Kale. If you joined us late, you can see all of this show again anytime on the website, aljazeera.com. Al Jazeera continues its comprehensive coverage of the Gaza war 24 hours a day. If you'd like to give us your thoughts on the situation, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. We're also on X, Twitter still to many of us, and we are at AJ Inside Story. For me, James Bays, and the team, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.